Okay, it's 201. And since this event is about three minutes duration of speaking, I think it's good to get on, on the go within one minute of being on time. So I really want to welcome everybody here today to the 3MT, which stands for three minute thesis. This is the first time I have uh, been hosting this event or facilitating. Um, and before we get started, I want to send out a very heartfelt thank you and congratulations to Julie Bowering from the School of Graduate Studies. Have a little wave, Julie. You deserve it. <laughs> She's not going to wave. Wait, Thank you. Uh, she, she really <laughs> does want to wave. Julie works tirelessly for all kinds of career development opportunities for students. The 3MT is just one example of that, but I want to say this has been an outstanding success within faculties and now here. It's the largest session we've had to date, and I really want to extend congratulations to Julie. This is phenomenal. And it's really great for our students. So thank you so much, Julie. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate that. Okay, first slide. Let's get started. So before we get started, I want to, of course, do our land acknowledgement. And uh, I want to formally acknowledge the lands on which Memorial University's campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse indigenous groups. And we acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of the Biotic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this province. We encourage everyone to reflect on these lands from where you are located and the indigenous peoples for whom these lands are traditional territory. So just a very brief competition history for maybe for some of our judges and also for attendees, the three minute thesis, 3MT, is an international skills development activity which challenges research higher degree students, usually PhD, to explain their research project to a non-specialist audience in just three minutes. It was developed by the University of Queensland in 2008 and enthusiasm for the 3MT concept and its adoption in numerous universities led to this development of an international uh, competition. So it's my pleasure to welcome our three members of our judging panel. Um, if they would like to give a little wave, feel free if you're not uh, as shy as Julie. Um, I'd like to welcome Mr. Stuart Baird, Vice President Sales and Operations from Country Ribbon. Welcome, Stuart. Thank you. And I also wanna welcome Mandy Penny. Uh, Mandy is a very new MBA Social Enterprise and Entrepreneurship graduate from Memorial University. Mandy also holds a social work degree. Welcome, Mandy. Thank you for joining us. Hello. And I should mention you also um, are employed with Inclusion NL. And I want to welcome Andrea Warman, Alumni Engagement Officer with Alumni Engagement at Memorial University. Thank you so much for joining us, Andrea. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great. Okay, next slide, please. I think you have the bios there too, right, uh, Amy? There's, n hold on one second. I was thinking they were gonna pop up and. Are, are you able to quickly, let me just open this up again. They're not showing up for me, Julie, where should I be looking? Oh, because I sent them to you. Yeah. I. What in the email that you sent me, um, I have order of competitors in the PowerPoint presentation. Is it in a separate one? Is it the one I sent you yesterday? Okay. Working on the weekend. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I have them. So, Great. Thank you so okay. much for saving me there. So oh, no after the welcome, I just want to give us some background on the judges. And I think the bios are so important, not just because they have such a uh, wide ranging experience. But also it gives us the perspective on why it's important to have people from a diverse background um, assess this competition, because that's really the point is to see um, people's understanding of your presentation from diverse backgrounds. So Stuart Baird is a Bachelor of Commerce uh, 1990 graduate from Memorial University and also a member, a former member of the university's varsity swimming team. Stuart, I didn't know till this weekend we had a swim team and I've been at MUN forever. So I thought that that's so cool that you're part of the, that were, you were part of the swim team. Um, Stuart spent the first 16 years of his career in sales, bringing him to Ontario where he spent 10 years in senior sales and marketing roles with tier one companies, including the packaged goods, medical diagnostic equipment and over the counter pharmaceuticals industry. In 2005, Stuart was recruited back to Newfoundland and Labrador 
to lead the sales and marketing function of Country Ribbon, where he's been pre vice president of sales and operations for the past five years. He's all, he also leads shipping, live procurement, and quality assur assurance for the company and is a member of its executive team. So I'm really glad you were able to come back to Newfoundland and Labrador, Stuart. So welcome. Mandy Penny, um, so I gave a little bit of a preview with extending her job title, but Mandy Pen Penny has her Bachelor of Arts Honors in Psychology with a minor in Sociology and a Bachelor of Social Work degree, and most recently, a Master's of Business Administration, Social Enterprise, and Entrepreneurship from Memorial University. Mandy is passionate about employment and entrepreneurship opportunities for people with disabilities. She is currently participating in the Center for Social Enterprises Incubator developing a social enterprise based on a network that provides educational, mentoring, and network opportunities to young entrepreneurs with disabilities. So welcome again, Mandy. And finally, we have Andrea Warman. Andrea completed a diploma in community recreation leadership at the College of North Atlantic in 1999, and then transferred to Memorial University to complete a Bachelor of Recreation with a minor in business administration in 2001. Andrea went on to work with Eastern Health for five years, where she worked throughout the mental health program, as well as the adult rehabilitation and as a, recre as a recreation specialist. Andrea returned to Memorial to complete a Master's of Education Post-Secondary Studies in 2008, taught a Human Kinetics and Recreations course, and then transitioned from the field of recreation to higher education and became the Manager of Domestic Student Recruitment from Memorial University. Andrea then moved to the Middle East to manage College of the North Atlantic Qatar Campus Student Life Office for four years. After moving to South Africa for nearly a year, she then returned to St. John's to accept a position in student affairs at the Marine Institute, and from there moved to the role of manager of the Office of Student Affairs at the Faculty of Medicine for five years. Two years ago, Andrea became an alumni engagement officer at Memorial where she develops and implements program and programming and events designed to facilitate connections and engage with alumni, friends memorial, as well as students. So welcome back as well to Andrea who traveled wide and far to say the least, um, which is pretty phenomenal, I must say. So with those fabulous introduction of our judges, that's not meant to pressure you. I think it really shows that you're trying to highlight uh, your thesis for people who are from this huge uh, diverse background and uh, I think that should show be benefit be of benefit to you, particularly if you've practiced this uh, for wide audi audiences or that's your target audience. Okay, so next slide, please. So the rules, this is what a lot of you are worrying about here. I'm sure getting ready. So a couple of rules and just uh, some that weren't on this that we just talked about it at the beginning of the session. While people are presenting, please try not to use the chat function as it can be distracting. For the presenters, it may be a good idea to go to the right hand corner. If you have your chat open and close the chat by hitting the X button in the chat, that'll help you have the full screen and won't be as distracting. If during someone's presentation, you really feel the need to ask a question, there's always the ability to use the private chat function where you can ask Julie a question privately. Just select that as the option before you hit send on your message. So here are some other rules. It needs to be a single static PowerPoint slide, no slide transitions, animations, or movement of any description. The slide is to be presented from the beginning of the oration. There are no additional electronic media, for example, sound or video files. There are no additional props like costumes, musical instruments, laboratory equipment. Presentations, as you know, are limited to three minutes maximum. Competitors exceeding three minutes are disqualified. This is a really, really tricky part of this competition, but it is what it's all about. You will have a timer and um, I believe beforehand you have advised Julie if you want to know your time, but the timer stays in the background no matter what. Julie, are we still going with the suggestion just to put a post-it on the timer if you don't want to see it? Actually, um, they can open it in another browser now or even on their phone so they don't have to see it. If okay. they don't want to. So it's your fine. choice to see it or not. In my experience, seeing it's not necessarily a bad thing when you only have three minutes, but I trust your judgment. But you do only have three minutes. So it's a short amount of time to get this done. Um, presentations are to be spoken word. So no poems, raps, or songs. Presentations are considered to have commenced 
once a presenter starts their presentation through movement or speech. So your slide can be up once you start speaking, the clock starts and the decision of the judges is final. Next slide, please. So the criteria for our three esteemed judges, this is where the pressure's on you. Comprehension and content. Did the presentation help the audience understand the research? And was the thesis topic and its significance communicated in language appropriate to an intellect, but non-specialist audience? That's key. And second, engagement and communication. Did the oration make the audience want to know more? And the prizes, the exciting part for our participants. First prize is $1,000, second prize is 500, and third prize is $250. Okay, so I think any, we're getting ready to get started. Is that right, Julie? Start it now with the initial, the Perfect. first presenter. So I just wanna make sure right before we talk, uh, we get started, there are no questions from our participants. I'll do a last call for questions. Sorry, I just have a very quick question. Is this Heather? No, this is not. This is Sarah. Oh, sorry. I'm just asking this a very quick question, which is, are you, we sent our slides to you. Are you putting the slides up? Julie, are you yes, putting the this, slides up? Yes, it's all part of the presentation. Okay, yeah, so there's we There's no will sharing of your share screen or no okay. sharing of slides. Thank you, that's all. Okay. Great, Sarah, so you just need to focus on when you start talking. And I think uh, that's my last call for questions. So I, on behalf of SGS and Memorial, I wanna wish you all really good luck. Uh, usually for presentations, I tell people to take their time, but I'm not gonna say that this time because you have three minutes, but do your best to you know get what you need to get out in the short amount of time you have. And I'm sure your efforts will, will be, will be um, you know, well-received. So good luck everyone. And with that, we'll get started with Heather Dix. And I'll just do a brief introduction. Heather is a PhD in sociology with the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. And Heather's presentation, in three minutes, she will discuss her thesis, which is how have remittances associated with migrants from the Global South living in St. John's, Newfoundland, been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic? Okay, Julie, I'll let you get started and I will mute myself. Are you re ready, Heather? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, so I can get started whenever, is that the plan? Yes, you can start right now if you'd like, yeah. Perfect. Okay, remittances. Most of the time when people use this term, what they're referring to is money that's sent from a migrant living in one country back to people living in their home country. More often than not, the picture that's painted here is of a migrant that's coming from a lower income country, moving to a higher income country for work, and then sending money back home to support their family and community. This flow of money is really often talked about as holding incredible potential for economic growth and poverty alleviation in lower income countries. Recently though, researchers have started to realize that the way that we've been talking about remittances has really been a big oversimplification. I mean, first off, it's not just money that migrants are sending back home. Rather, there are ideas and behaviors and even social norms that migrants are sharing with their home communities. And these are having a major impact on these locales. Second, it's not just a one way exchange. Migrants are affecting their host communities. The towns and cities where they're living and working, they're bringing into these places their own money, their own values, their own ideas. So this web of exchanges that's happening along migration corridors between host and home communities in rich and poor countries, it's spurring development and change on both sides. I wonder what this looks like for St. John's. And I wonder what would happen to this beautiful, complex network of exchanges if, say, 
a global pandemic were to come along and impact our entire lives, our economies, even our ability to engage with one another. That's what my research is all about. I'm talking to migrants living in St. John's and I'm asking them about the resources, including money, but also ideas and values that they're bringing into the city of St. John's, as well as those that they're sending back to their home communities. I want migrants themselves to tell me about what this network of exchanges looks like and what impact it's having so that we can gain a ground up understanding of the critical role that these individuals are playing in the development of our globalized world. And most importantly, I want to uncover how all of this may have been disrupted by a global pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. And uh, you did not go over time. Is that correct, Julie? Well, I'll find out from my assistant after <laughs> when yes, he was I, doing the timing. I've been, taking it, I've been taking it in the background, so I think oh, you're, okay. you're fine. Yeah, just uh, as a backup. I just wanted to remind um, you as well that we are going to give the judges just a couple of minutes to make notes between them if they Perfect. need to make notes between each presentation. So we'll just so have a, a minute now for the judges to take some notes. Yep. Thank you so much, Heather. Judges, are you okay to proceed? Thumbs up. Good. Okay. Maybe the next uh, slide there, please, Julie. Okay. So we're on to presenter number two. I want to welcome Bellini Kimarashini. I hope I pronounced your name okay. Can maybe you come on screen there, Bellini? Yes. Would you pronounce your last name for me? So that uh, Kumar Singha. Kumar Singha. Okay. Yeah. That's, that sounds much more beautiful than what I did. So I apologize. So welcome. No um, yeah. Alina, you are a PhD in biochemistry from the Faculty of Science. And yes. your thesis that you're presenting on today is safe, novel, intravenous baby meal recipe. So whenever you are ready, please begin. Look at this kid. Such a suffering kid still smiles innocently with rejoiced eyes because he has a hope to live. My research focus to bring a hope to these innocent smiling faces. I tried to come up with the intravenous meal recipe for these innocent babies who cannot fed normally because of they are having physical and functional barriers. Before starting, I have a small question for you. Have any of your baby been in a neonatal critical care unit? It's one of the terrifying nightmares a parent could have experienced. Believe me, it's so depressing. On the other hand, sick babies put a country's economy under a lot of strain. For an example, Canada spent $587 million per year for all preterm babies. For a year, 30 million babies, that's part of the total, being born too soon, too small, become sick, demanding a specialized care to live. Some of these babies cannot acquire their nutrition through the mouth. That's where intravenous nutrition bring, plays a big role. That is giving all the nutrients in, in the infusion bag directly into the baby's bloodstream. But sadly, this innocent, this Life-saving method also can cause several complications. Two of the biggest issues are the poor gut health and liver health, causing these babies' lives to danger once more. What is the reason for that? Formation of chemicals. There are several chemical reactions take place inside this infusion bag during preparation, storage, and infusion, forming hundreds of chemicals. I talk them as oxidants, 
and light can trigger this damage. And apart from that, unstable molecules can trigger this damage. So this damage continues inside the baby's body, damaging all the system's cells, organs. So this is where my contribution as a graduate student comes in. I try to reduce the oxidative damage, that's the chemical damage inside these bags. I am using piglets for my research because it's a more suitable model for human nutrition. So I'm doing minor changes to this current diet. I am adding vitamin E, C, changing these bags from light and changing the unstable molecules, choosing fish oils over vegetable-based oils and C, damage, it, it causes piglet's health mainly from the gut and liver. And finally, I will be able to treat these sick babies, secure their smiles and give a ray of hope to their innocent parents. Thank you. Thank you so much, Salini. And your time according to my clock was okay, so I'm sure it's fine. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna invite the judges to take some notes. Okay, judges, are you okay to proceed? Thumbs up for Mandy, thumbs up, Andrea. Stuart, are you okay? Great. Okay, Julie, we'll get the next slide up and I'll make sure our next presenter's with us, please. And uh, I'll make sure that, perfect, Janelle is here. Um, just wanna let everyone know, I think I forgot to mention this at the beginning. On the left-hand bottom corner, you have the option now with WebEx through um, these events to click closed captioning. And I use closed captioning all the time. It, I often hope it helps me kind of focus on presentations. But if you also have a hearing impairment, it's a good benefit now that we can actually offer live closed captioning. So please click the CC button, which stands for closed captioning in the left-hand corner of your WebEx if you would like to use it. Okay, I wanna welcome Janelle Skahard. Janelle, did I do that okay? Scared. How do you say, Janelle? Scared. Scared. Oh, I made it way more complicated than I had to. So welcome. Sounded Janelle. lovely. Scared. Well, it sounds lovely the other way too. So welcome, Janelle. You are one of our interdisciplinary PhD students, um, and your thesis is mining the rock towards a benefit sharing framework for genetic research in Newfoundland and Labrador. So with that introduction, I welcome you to start whenever you're ready, Janelle. Good luck. More than 20 years ago, a group of researchers from Texas came to Newfoundland. They took family histories, drew blood samples, and then vanished. We call them the Texas vampires for fairly obvious reasons. Families are left wondering whether they carried a gene which, left untreated, would almost always mean certain death, possibly by age 30. Newfoundland is home to a founder population, a group of individuals descended from common ancestry. In genetic research, this gives researchers a homogenous or similar population to work with and can make identifying genes or creating pharmaceuticals just a little bit easier. The Newfoundland genome has been known as a valuable research resource for decades. 
The purpose of my thesis is to determine whether we can conceptualize the Newfoundland genome in a way that's similar to other types of natural resources. And if we can, well, how can we ensure that developing it benefits the residents of this province? Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have always depended on natural resources for our economic security. And we have lots of rules in place to make sure that the province benefits when outside companies come in and access those resources. We receive royalties, we grant licenses, and we record that our residents are given employment. However, no such benefit sharing plans exist for the Newfoundland genome. Now, when you think about a natural resource, you probably think about mining or fishing. And just because we describe the Newfoundland genome as a natural resource, doesn't mean that it fits the definition perfectly. We need to carefully consider the ways in which the Newfoundland genome is similar to, but different from other types of natural resources. You see, genes aren't really things, but they're also not really people either. They fall into a strange gray area. This is why we need to look at the rules that we have in place for other natural resources and see what fits and what doesn't. The purpose of my research is to make sure that what happened in the 1990s never happens again, to ensure that the residents of this province have a stake in how this valuable resource is developed. Because ultimately, I want to ensure that the next time a proverbial knocks on our door, we're able to ask a few questions and talk about possible benefits before we invite them in. Thank you, Janelle. I want to make sure your sound didn't cut out at the end. You you are finished? Yes, I'm finished. Okay, perfect, Janelle. I just wanted to make sure because I couldn't see you on screen. So that's great. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll give the judges a minute or so, and then I'll ask them when they're ready. I see Mandy, you're ready. Andrea, you're okay. Stuart, good to go. Excellent. Okay, Julie, next slide for our next presenter, please. Okay, I'd like to welcome Nadine Leduc. Can I see Nadine to make sure they're on the screen? Oh, yay, I see you. <laughs> welcome. And Nadine is Master's of Arts Sociology with our faculties, Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. And Nadine, your thesis is the impact of organizational culture on the well being of emergency communications officials. So, Nadine, whenever you're ready, please, uh, we'll get your slide up and then you can, whenever you're ready, you can start. Good luck. If you have ever called 911, did you stop and wonder how the operator felt after your call? Most don't. So, as some background, public safety personnel emerged as a term to be more inclusive than first responders, which historically included police, fire, and paramedics. So it opened the door to research public safety communicators, also referred to as 911 operators. And much like other public safety personnel, 911 operators also suffer operational stress injuries, which I will refer to as OSIs. Now, OSIs and 911 operators are too often hidden, and they occur at rates higher than the general population, largely due to their constant work-related exposure to potentially psychologically traumatic events. But since they are understudied, there are very little uh, data on the OSI rates in this group. And though researchers have identified organizational culture as a key factor in employee well-being, there are no pan-Canadian studies focusing on organizational culture and its potential influence on OSIs within the communicator context so that is what I aim to study. 
And as part of a larger survey of 911 operators, I asked four open ended questions relating to organizational culture. And I believe this is relevant to everyone because communicators do play a pivotal role and any broken links can impact outcomes and impede the delivery of critical services. So initial findings revealed that 911 operators feel undervalued and demoralized, experience a lack of support or understanding specifically from management. But key finding here is that they regularly experience discomfort disclosing mental health struggles. So their well-being is compromised by the nature of their work and is amplified by their working conditions. Now, positive themes were also revealed, such as a sense of being part of a team and feeling good about helping the public. And so these are indications of what we can leverage and build upon when developing future solutions. So our hope is that our new understanding of organizational culture's role may reduce the frequency and severity of operational stress injuries, ensuring that emergency services are reliably delivered, and the data from our study can help inform better organizational practices, create healthier working, healthier working conditions, and improve support aimed at reducing mental health struggles. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, and I, you were fine for time as well. So what I'll do is give the judges a minute or so to take some notes. Thanks so much, Nadine. Okay, judges, okay, great, thumbs up, excellent. Okay, Julie, please advance to the next slide. Okay, I wanna welcome Bronwyn Sinclair. Bronwyn, are you there? I am. Excellent, and we can hear you, so that's great. Welcome, Bronwyn. Bronwyn is a Master of Arts Geography, a student with the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, and Bronwyn's thesis title is The Siren Call of Preservation. So, Bronwyn, I'm going to just, um, okay, your slide is up. So whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you. So why are lighthouses important? Well, I argue that they are key indicators for economic and environmental policy, and they always have been. In the past, they were an indicator for the economic development of our oceans. Decades, even centuries were spent on industrial development to bolster an economy built on resource extraction. And these lighthouses were built in response to a hostile climate. Storms, rocks, variants in coastlines, fog patterns, the harbors that sheltered communities and allowed them to grow, also and gave them a safe place to dock their fishing vessels, also had dangerous rocks and often had narrow straits leading into them. Lighthouses are expensive and they're very high maintenance and they always have been, but they were built because otherwise people died. And in many cases, these lighthouses are what put these communities on the map. However, the ocean is and always will be a hostile environment. Climate change is not an imminent threat. It is already here and we have been living with it. Even though precious few municipalities have outright made policies around climate change, that doesn't mean that we haven't been making climate policies. For example, when we decide to invest in a tourist economy, it is essential to look at not just the attraction, but also the surrounding infrastructure and civil planning. What is the state of the roads? What is the state of the facilities? What are the businesses around the 
attraction that we are using to bring tourists to our regions. The way that we have written our policies responding to seasonal sinkholes, flash flooding, coastal erosion, the placement of our highways, or even the approval of residential permits and zoning, those are all climate policies. Perhaps they're reactionary policies rather than proactive, but they are still a measurable response to our climate realities, and that's why I'm researching them. My thesis is about identifying how these lighthouses have survived and what those methods mean for their communities. When the Cod Moratorium happened in the 1990s, rural Newfoundland and Nova Scotian communities found themselves facing deindustrialization, as well as a politically neoliberal government that favored hands-off policies around economic development. Facing an economic collapse with only the support of short-term funding, these communities have done what they can to transition their livelihoods. Many responded by commodifying their heritage, and by shifting to tourism, they could highlight the historical value of their lighthouses. In this process, they have creatively destroyed these essential pieces of marine infrastructure and turned them into a tourist attraction that allows their town to continue to exist. But not every lighthouse gets to be a Cape Spear or a Peggy's Cove. And that's why I'm interviewing both legislative representatives from the municipal to federal scale, as well as the lighthouse stewards and historical societies to understand how are these policies made and what does it mean to live with and within them. To understand where we're going as a region, we have to understand where we've been, what decisions were made, and the economic geography of rural Atlantic Canadian communities. The picture on my slide is of a lighthouse in Barrington, Nova Scotia. The houses around the lighthouse stood only 30 years ago, but they don't exist anymore. All that's left is stone foundations. So many more lighthouses are like Cape Sable Island than Cape Spear. And we have to ask ourselves what that means for the economic livelihoods of our rural communities. These structures, like economies, exist because we put in the work to maintain and develop them. And as we've seen time and time again, if these places are left to the elements, all we will have are smooth pebbles on a shrinking beach. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Bronwyn. Judges, I'll give you a minute or so. Mandy and Andrea, you seem to be okay. Stuart, you can just let me know when you are. All good, excellent. Okay, Julie, next slide, please. Okay, I'd like to welcome Joanna Bosch. Joanna, are you on screen? Oh, I can see you there, yeah, great. I'm here, can you hear me welcome. okay? Yes, I can, great. Uh, well, welcome, Joanna. Uh, Joanna is a Master of Science Biology Faculty of Science student. Joanna's thesis is entitled Capturing Seabird Gut Microbes in Pond Sediments. Okay, I'm going to get uh, Julie to please put your slide on the screen. And then whenever you're ready, please begin. I want you to take a second and picture yourself standing on the edge of a cliff in Newfoundland next to North America's most accessible seabird colony, Bird Rock. Imagine the sound and the stench of 10,000 northern units. Suddenly, one flying by you releases a little white torpedo, and the wind is so strong, it lands right on your jacket. For a second, you consider it as more than just bird crap. You consider the millions of bacteria, fungi, and even viruses that were once part of the gannet's gut microbiome. This time, you are the unlucky human. But most of the time, the gannet's waste is returned to the environment surrounding their nesting colony. Gannet feces contains high amounts of nitrogen isotopes that accumulate in layers of sediment found in nearby ponds over time. This in turn causes increased levels of metals and chlorophyll A. In paleolimnology, we can use nitrogen isotopes, metals, and chlorophyll A as an indicator of past population sizes. We call this proxy data. 
My project will investigate the biological and chemical shifts in sediment cores taken from the impacted pond you see here that is nearby the colony and to control ponds farther down the coastline. But we will also test a new proxy, those symbiotic gut microbes. We predict that the gut microbes will be found in the top layers of the sediment core, while the stable nitrogen isotopes and chlorophyll A levels will correlate with the rise and the fall of the gannet population over time. Currently, we know that the Gannet colony has grown from around 20 individuals in 1880 to well over 10,000 individuals today. And during this time, the Gannets have shown resilience, experiencing breeding failures and even surviving a 1960 colony collapse due to human activity. By working with individuals a part of the University and Environment and Climate Change Canada, we hope to provide a time series of the past population dynamics. The data we collect will contribute to the conservation of bird rock and the protection of gannets nesting there. Seabirds like the gannet are important predators of marine coastal ecosystems, yet they have historically been overlooked in many forms of research. There's one major gap we've encountered because of this. No one has ever sequenced the gannet gut microbiome. In fact, this is the case for many wild seabirds. So while one part of this project involves taking fecal samples from birds to define those distinct microbes, another part involves understanding how we can use those gut microbes as an indicator of seabird presence. If all goes well, this proxy will offer a more targeted approach to use with more common proxies like nitrogen isotope analysis. Molecular genetics has opened a lot of doors for paleo researchers who want to combine their work with targeted approaches using eDNA. My project is just one example of this, but there are a lot of possibilities out there. So next time you're standing on your study site, consider that diverse microbial ecosystem you cannot see. It can offer a lot more than you might expect. Thank you, Joanna. I'll just mm -hmm. give the judge a minute. Judges, are we okay? Thank you, Mandy. Stuart's good, Andrea, great. Thank you so much. Okay, Julie, we can advance to the next slide, please. Great, thank you. I'm just gonna make sure, Erin Renek, are you with us? I'm here. And it's Ariane or Arian? Arian, did I say it right the second? Yeah, you, you got it. Okay, great. So welcome, Irian, and Irian is a Master of Fine Arts with the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at our Granville campus of Memorial University. Irian's thesis is titled Redefining the Traditional Gallery Experience Through Interactive and Neuro-Inclusive Artwork. So welcome, Irian, and Julie, can you please advance to Irian's slide? And whenever you're ready, please begin. Good luck. When I was young, art was part of learning in school. Personally, it was the fun part. Gallery visits anticipated excitement. But what did I want to do once we got there? Touch the art. The last time you visited a gallery, how did it make you feel? I've had opportunities to view works by famous historical artists like Claude Monet, works that are supposed to be the highlight of any museum visit. And what do I remember most? the alarms that went off when someone got too close to a painting and the guards telling visitors to stay away from the artwork. These rules exist because the oils in your hands can destroy the chemical makeup of materials, which in time will damage the art, but the memories taken away by visitors are consequently not filled with enthusiasm for the work, but of the rules they had to follow. The experiences are often dry, lacking aspects of excitement for many like children and neurodivergent individuals. 
Neurodivergent is a term which categorizes those, like myself, who do not have a typically functioning brain and are diagnosed with a disorder such as ADHD or autism. My current research focuses on creating work that combines the use of optical illusions and interactivity. These playful works allow the spectator to become a participant, to touch the usually untouchable while having their visual senses be pleasantly surprised. Optical illusions cause your visual senses to be unsure of how to interpret them, producing confusion and curiosity. These intertwined with movement and interaction create a form of play, they facilitate fun, and create an inclusive experience where everyone can be a part of the work at the same time giving into their desire to touch art. So why is this important? When we have fun, chemicals in our brain like dopamine and serotonin are released, giving us feelings of pleasure and happiness. This affects a list of psychological and physical factors, including attention, mood, motivation, and sleep. Neurodivergent individuals often are often already have a chemical imbalance in their brain, causing them to be afflicted by these impairments more regularly. In my interactive experiment displayed at CB Nui, there were hundreds of participants who were elated with joy through playing with visually stimulating art. So many people who expressed their enjoyment for the ability to participate. I had multiple neurodivergent people express to me how happy it made them and how they felt like the art was meant for them. I was even told, this is the most fun I've had in over a year. Interacting with artwork makes the experience a more personal one. It brings a sense of energy into a usually stale environment. It allows participants to leave with an elevated mood, great memories, and a new outlook on what art is allowed to be and do. So please, enjoy touching the art. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, judges, I'll give you a moment. Thank you, Irian. Sorry, I was on mute. Mandy, are you good to go? Stuart, you okay? And Andrea is good. Great. Okay, Julie, if you could advance to the next slide, I'd really appreciate it. Okay, we have Rifat. Rifat, are you with us? Uh, yeah. Make sure you're great, and I can hear you, so that's great. So welcome. Um, Rifat is a PhD student in theoretical physics with the Faculty of Science at Memorial. Rifat, the title of uh, Rifat's thesis is Automation in High Energy Physics. From, I'm going to get this wrong, aren't I? Lag rage, lag, oh my, I knew I'd stress over this one. Lag Rangian. Lagrangian, too. Lagrangian, there we go. Huh? It's the combination of the G's. Lagrangian. Yep. Uh, Lagrangian to observables. So I'm going to say that again to get it right, to give it the due that it, it the due time it, uh, it should get. Automation and high energy physics from Langrangian. See, I just did it again. I'm going to get you to say Lagrangian. Lagrangian to observables. So Refat, I'm gonna stop butchering the title of your thesis. This is not my area, can you tell? <laughs> this is not yeah. my area since high school. Um, I'm gonna ask Julie to advance to your slide and then whenever you're ready, Refat, please begin. Now, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'll be talking about my PhD research. Uh, our group works in precision physics phenomenology. So which basically means we model future uh, particle physics experiments, and then we give them uh, experimentally some result, and then they'll work on that. Uh, so we work on the assumption that the universe was uh, created with a big bang. The universe was really energetic, which cooled off to give us particles. And uh, all particle we see around us today is basically made up of only two uh, like three here you can see on the slide this up quark 
down quark and electron. So there are some other particles, uh, which in the standard model of particle physics, this model is uh, what we have so far, or the existing knowledge of particle physics we have. But uh, the problem with this model is, uh, like from some experimental evidences and experimental data, we see this model is not complete and it has a lot of problem in it. Uh, and so we have to work on the theory and make a better theory. So some of those problems include like, uh, why are there uh, only this many particles? Are there more particles? Do we have more particles than this? Like uh, one of the most fundamental things we observe in nature is gravity. This model does not explain gravity or like there are some other problems as well. Like when we do experiment, we see matter and antimatter annihilates, but we still see there are more matter than any matter we have in the universe. So there are several other problems uh, in this standard model. So uh, in order to get a better model, uh, theorists, uh, they give a Lagrangian or like some physical model and work on that. And one way to solve those is like solving them mathematically, which is really hard. So we use Feynman diagrams and I actually use a, make a package called Finder's Helper, which actually help us to ease those mathematical computation and like it help us like it is the process so that we can build better models and give the experimental this better data at a more precision data so that they can help with uh, they can carry on more experiment and find out new particles or any other things about those particles which might help us like in the past they did with like uh, like some things like the baby diapers or uh, the mri machine or grid computer uh, so many real life things that we can do with them. So that's, so my model is what I'm currently working on. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Rifat. I'll give the judges a moment to deliberate or not to deliberate, to take notes, I guess is a better word. Andy, you okay? Stuart, good go. And Andrew is good. Okay, Julie, please put up our next slide. Okay, Katja Kochvar. Am I saying your name correctly, Katja? Yes, that's good. Okay, great. And I can hear you, so that's excellent. We did two things at once. So I want to welcome Katja with us, who is a Master of Science in Cognitive and Behavioral Ecology with the Faculty of Science at Memorial. And Katja's thesis is titled Exploring the Signal, Signal Value of the Colorful Atlantic Puffin Bill in Mated Pairs. So Julie, if you could advance to Katja's slide. And whenever you're ready, please begin. Great. Hi everyone, today I will be discussing my proposed master's thesis research on why Atlantic puffins have such a bright, colorful bill. So colorful features are used across the animal kingdom to convey all sorts of kinds of information. They can be used as warning signals to say, hey, don't eat me to a prey or a predator. They can be used to indicate which species you belong to or which individual you are in a social group. Or they can tell you something about the quality of the individual or their attractiveness which is super important when making decisions about which mate you want to be with or whether you want to invest or put effort into your current chick. So this is really interesting in the context of puffins because puffins are monogamous birds that live for a pretty long time, over 25 years in some cases. And they have something called obligate biparental care, meaning both the female and male parent are required to successfully raise their single chick to fledging or leaving the burrow. So my hypothesis is that there is this link between the body condition, the puffin bill coloration, and how good of a parent they are. And the way this might work is through a biomolecule called carotenoids. 
And carotenoids are important because they give rise to the red orange pigmentation of the colorful bill, as well as ensure that the individual has a significantly good body condition. Body condition being how well they can forage, their immune functioning, and their parasite load. And only individuals in the best of body condition are able to be good parents and successfully raise those chicks. So you can imagine that there could be this link between the colorful bill, the current body condition of the individual, and how well they're able to parent their chick. And if this is the case, and, and pigmentation is an honest indicator of parental quality, then perhaps mated pairs are able to assess each other and decide how much they want to invest in their current chick based on how healthy their parent, their individual partner is. So I'm investigating this in a subset of Atlantic puffins on Gull Island in Whitless Bay, just 25 kilometers south of here. And I have a couple different data sets that I'm looking at. So I have images of the puffin bill in both the visual and ultraviolet spectrum because these birds can see in the UV, pretty cool. I also have measurements of their body mass and wing length to determine what kind of body condition they're in. And I have two different ways to monitor what kind of parents they are. So I have an RFID system that tracks essentially when they go in and out of the burrow and visit their chick. And I also have audio recorders inside the burrow that records the chick begging calls to determine if the visit actually was accompanied with food. So whether the parent was, a bit, was actually feeding their chick or whether they were just stopping by. And my thesis is essentially putting all of this together to explore one way that the Atlantic Puffin Bill might provide some sort of information and might be so colorful. Thanks so much. Thank you very, very much for your presentation. Katja, okay, I'll invite the judges to take a second. Judges, are we okay to go? Thumbs up, thumbs up. Mandy, you're good? Great. Okay, Julie, next slide, please. Okay, I welcome Bronwyn Bridges. Bronwyn, do you want to say hello? Hi, just making sure you can Sound hear good. me. Yep, perfect. Great. Thank you so much. Bronwyn is a Master of Science student with the Pharma with uh, Master of Science in Pharmacy with the School of Pharmacy at Memorial. Bronwyn's thesis is titled Remote Patient Monitoring for Parkinson's Disease. So if we could advance to Bronwyn's slide. Thank you. Uh, Bronwyn, whenever you're ready, good luck. Universal healthcare coverage is a hot topic, but one that many of us know surprisingly little about beyond surface level slogans from campaign signs or bumper stickers. We do know every Canadian with legal status has healthcare covered. However, because of this, hospital closures and physician income caps have led to some physicians leaving, an increase in wait times, and a decrease in access for some patients. Seeing a specialist is a whole other story that leads to even higher demands on fewer qualified physicians and therefore even longer wait times. Currently, over 100,000 Canadians are living with Parkinson's disease. This debilitating condition predominantly affects dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra pars compacta. The lack of dopamine presents itself in clinical features such as bradykinesia, rigidity, and tremor at rest. I spent the last two years researching the impacts that polyphenols and blueberry fruits can have in providing antioxidant properties to protect Parkinson's disease patients. Although there is no cure, the research was very promising as you can see from the graph below. The cells treated with glutamate, a compound found in high levels in PD patients, were protected when treated with a blueberry mash. We also published a review article to present our findings over COVID and the promising avenues that this research could have. The next step would be to try this on the human population, but we live in Newfoundland. How are we supposed to accurately treat and monitor patients in extremely rural areas? Enter PragmaClin. The question is, how can we make healthcare more accessible to all, especially those in our more vulnerable populations? PragmaClin's goal is to create viable solutions to improve the lives of patients living with debilitating diseases. So we created PRIMS. PRIMS is a Parkinson's remote interactive monitoring system. As you can see, the software is able to monitor movements so that patients can provide data from home. 
patients can view a dashboard upon login that shows where to complete a new test to view previous results that can be downloaded to a computer, as well a graph showing their progress and a scale showing where they currently are sitting based on their last set of ratings. As well, a clinician can view a separate dashboard in which they can see all of their patients data in more detail. One aspect that sets us apart from the rest is using depth cameras instead of sensors. We wanted to ensure that patients who struggle with fine motor tasks are still able to use the system without a need to strap on devices to their bodies. So far, we've raised $181,000 to develop a prototype solution to move towards the next phase of product development. The software is able to be mass produced and cover also more diseases than just Parkinson's alone. Clinicians are able to assess patients remotely with greater accuracy. Hospitals can use the virtual system to reduce wait times and overhead costs, and research organizations can also use PRIMS to study a wide range of topics. The market size for remote patient monitoring systems is expected to hit 85 billion US dollars by the end of 2026. So now is the perfect time for our company. We also want to make a difference in the lives of not only Parkinson's patients, but the medical field in general. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bronwyn. I'll give the judges a moment. Also, thanks for having two brown ones in one Zoom call. I've never had that happen before. I <laughs> wasn't going to say anything. I've actually never met a brown one in person, and there's two here today. Yeah, what you started saying brown one. You can start, and I was like, I didn't think it was my uh -oh. turn. So <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so funny how you meet people with the same name. See brown one's comment in the chat. That's hilarious. yes, oh, honestly wow. the same. Yeah, it's funny. Hey judges, are we okay? Good. And Stuart, you're okay? All right. Great. Julie, if we could advance to the next slide, please. Great. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Sarah, are you with us? I see you. And Sarah, your last name, could you say it for me? Um, Muth. Muth. That's what I was going to say. I wanted to make sure that there wasn't a silent H there. Okay, I want to welcome Sarah Muth with us today. Sarah is a PhD in theoretical physics and, and master of science, applied mathematics with the faculty of science at Memorial. Sarah's thesis is titled marginally outer trapped open surfaces in four plus one dimensional space times. So, Julie, if you could advance to Sarah's slide, please. Great, thank you. Good luck, Sarah. Please When you lie down in the soft grass in the middle of a summer night and look up at a clear star-filled sky, what do you feel? Do you feel the vastness of space? Do you feel how small you are, how small the earth is, and how insignificant we are? I think this, what I've just described, is a nearly universal experience, pun intended. I think that there's a reason that human beings have been theorizing about our place in the universe for all of recorded history. Now, I and my colleagues study black holes. We do this because we end up with novel and counterintuitive insights into the nature of space and time. And since black holes are real astrophysical objects, we know that at least some of our insights are realized out there in the universe. In 2016, ripples in the fabric of space-time called gravitational waves were discovered. This was a long-standing prediction of our currently accepted theory of gravity and opened the door to a whole new way of detecting astrophysical events. The waves detected in 2016 had been produced by two black holes spiraling in toward one another and merging. An artist's rendition is shown at the top left of the slide. Motivated by this, we would like to understand how such a black hole merger process occurs. But there's a difficulty. The way we distinguish between the inside and the outside of a black hole is by a surface called the event horizon. But to find the event horizon, you actually need to know everything that happens for the entire past and future of the space time around the black hole. And as you can imagine, this proves difficult for complicated phenomena like a merger. So instead, we look for surfaces that are similar to the event horizon and so can give us insights into the nature of space and time around black holes, but that you don't need to know all of the past and future to find. These are called marginally outer trap surfaces, or MOTs for short. In my thesis, I continued the work of studying a unique kind of MOTs that were first discovered in 2019. MOTs that loop in on themselves, one of which you can see on the slide. 
I generalize these MOTs to theoretical five-dimensional spacetimes, which have one dimension more than our own universe. This shows that the looping behavior is at least somewhat generic. It exists in a variety of black holes, which also supports the claim that it's astrophysically real and not some numerical error or oddity. Working in five dimensions also allowed us to make the simplifications necessary to start studying rotating black holes. In doing so, I found a new type of MOTs, an example of which is this squiggly line on the slide on the right. We are currently finding more of these in other kinds of rotating black holes, including four dimensional ones, which is what exists out there in the universe. So what is the point? Understanding that these complicated shapes are likely to exist inside real black holes shows us that space and time are much stranger and more counterintuitive than we expect. But perhaps this shouldn't be surprising. One thing we tend to find when we study nature is that it always has something new and interesting in store for us. And is there any endeavor more human than trying to understand our place in the universe? As Carl Sagan said, the cosmos is in us. We are made of star stuff and humans are a way for the universe to know itself. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll give the judges a moment. Okay. Mandy and Stuart, I think you are both ready. So Andrea, you just let me know. Okay, Andrea, thank you. Julie, if we could go to the next slide, please. Great. So we have Rebecca Bennett up next. Rebecca, do you want to do a little sound check? Hello. Perfect. I can hear you. That's great. Welcome, Rebecca. Rebecca is a Master of Science Psychology student with the Faculty of Science at Memorial University. Rebecca's thesis is titled, How Chronic Stress Impacts Behavior and Bodily Function, an Animal Model Investigating the Behavioral and Circadian Impact of Chronic Predictable Stress in Mice. We could advance to Rebecca's slide. Great. Thank you. Rebecca, begin when you're ready. Good luck. So stress is a common occurrence in our day-to-day -day lives. As faculty, staff, students, employees, and humans, we all experience stress and perhaps on a day-to-day -day basis. However, despite how common stress is, its commonality doesn't diminish the negative impacts on our overall health. Chronic stress has been shown to disturb hormone levels and regulation suppress immune systems and leave us susceptible to disease and infection, and it also impacts our sleep and our sleep quality. When dealing with chronic stress, we can negatively impact our sleep onset, duration, and quality of sleep. And because sleep is needed to regulate and reset every day, these impairments impact our ability to deal with our daily challenges, further perpetuating the effects of stress. This results in a cyclic feedback loop or a runaway train effect where stress incites sleep disturbances and sleep disturbances reduces our capacity to deal with stress. Experiments in behavioral neuroscience using animal models allows me to investigate the fundamental effects chronic stress has on behavioral and sleep-wake activity in mice. Using a protected exposure box as seen in the diagram on the left, Mice can see, smell, and hear a rat, which is a natural predator animal. Afterwards, I measure anxiety-like behavior using tests such as the elevated plus maze shown in the middle. Mice are naturally explorative and normally spend time in the open arms, but when they're stressed, they'll hide away in the arms with the walls. Additionally, such as in the pilot study that we did, and you can see on the right there, we look at how much time they spend active at night using motion sensors. Because these animals are nocturnal and ought to be more active at night, it tells us that something isn't right if they're not active during their dark phase. Additionally, I want to understand how these effects can impact future generations. Research has shown that the parental stress experience can lead to downstream offspring effects, such as lower birth weights and increased susceptibility to illness. Preclinical animal models of research like mine can be used to help us understand more about the outcomes of chronic stress and help us develop solutions and treatments that may help us mitigate these debilitating outcomes. 
Furthermore, our children, both present and to come, will benefit from proactive approaches by taking our stress and health seriously. In a pandemic world, these studies are paramount to ensuring our well being for years to come. Thank you so much. My unmute button was being cantankerous. Okay, judges, I'll wait for the cue from you. Mandy, looks like you're ready. Andrea's ready. Stuart, are you okay? Good. All right. Next slide, please, Julie. Okay. Shinbag Chen. Shinbang, did I say your name correctly? Perfect. Great. Welcome. So I want to welcome Shinbang, um, who is a Master of Education student with the Faculty of Education at Memorial. Shinbang's thesis is titled Learning by Watching Tutorial Videos. The impact of dialogue and collaboration. Please advance to Shinbang's slide. Great, we can see it. Okay, Shinbang, whenever you're ready, please begin. Okay, hello. So, watching video to learn is a very popular way of learning nowadays. However, it lacks human interactions. So, most times we still prefer to go into the class and interact with our tutor so we can get instant feedback. But uh, in a lot of cases, such as during the pandemic, we can't, we can't go to the class and in-person meeting is not available and uh, we have to learn by watching video. So how can we improve the effectiveness of um, learn by watching video? So some researchers, they created a new type of video called dialogue videos, presenting the dialogue between a tutor and tutee. And they found when they let audience to watch the dialogue video compared with monologue videos, which is a more common format involving only one person's presentation, audience learn better from watching dialogue than from watching monologue videos. But compared with uh, in-person tutoring, watching dialogue video is still not comparable to that. So they kept looking for a better approach and they found something surprising. When they arrange audience to watch dialogue videos in pairs, so students watch the dialogue video and collaborate on learning tasks, and their learning outcomes were as high as those who attend in-person tutoring. So this is a significant finding because watching video is much cheaper than hiring a tutor. So for those learners who cannot afford a tutoring session, they can still watch your dialogue videos with a partner and learn effectively. However, the studies are still preliminary due to the small amount of studies and those previous experiments are conducted in English speaking countries and uh, um, among university students on sciences subjects. So in order to examine the dialogue video and uh, collaboration, there are benefits on video watching. I'm going to create a dialogue video and a monologue video about psychology, and I will invite junior high students to watch both videos, either in pairs or alone, and examine, measure their learning outcomes. So to determine the association between the dialogue videos um, and the collaboration and their learning outcomes. So from my study, uh, we'll give the educators and learners a clearer picture about how to make a powerful video tool and how to learn better by watching videos. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Shinbang. I'll let the judges have a moment. Thanks. 
steward looks ready. Andy, are you okay? Great, and Andrea's good. All right, next slide, please, Julie. Hey, I want to welcome Adam Meyer. I see you're on the screen. Do you want to do just a sound check? Hello, thanks. Great, perfect. I can hear you, Adam. That's great. Welcome. Adam is a PhD student of biology in the Faculty of Science with Memorial University. Adam's thesis title is Herbivore Impacts on Ecosystem Nitrogen Cycling, the Ge Zoo Geochemistry of Newfoundland Moose. Okay, I'm going to uh, get you to get uh, Adam's slide up, please, Julie. Excellent, we can see it. Adam, please begin when you're ready. Good luck. What do you see when you walk through the woods? Trees, soil, if you're quiet, maybe a moose. What's harder to see are the flows of matter that connect living things to each other and their environment, like the flow of nitrogen and essential nutrients. Nitrogen is recycled in complex pathways via plants, animals, soil, and microbes. By studying the details of these pathways, ecologists have discovered important connections between vastly different organisms, connections that can determine the functioning of entire ecosystems. My PhD is about the surprising connections between one of the world's largest animals, moose, and the microbes that make nitrogen recycling possible. But how do you study this? Past researchers have removed large herbivores like moose or caribou from a portion of an ecosystem and then compared these areas to controls. After decades of these long-term experiments, a general principle was emerging. In low nitrogen ecosystems like spruce forest, large herbivores slow the flow of nitrogen. But in high nitrogen ecosystems like savanna, they accelerate it. In both cases, the flow of nitrogen is controlled by the largest herbivores food choices. Unlike in physics, there's very few general laws in ecology. And after decades of research, it seemed like we might have one. So ecologists, we were excited but there's one big problem. Some recent studies have contradicted this principle, begging the question, is it wrong? Or is there simply more to it? For my PhD, I used differential equations to simulate the effects of herbivores on the nitrogen cycle. I discovered that the impacts of herbivore trampling on soil and soil microbes can theoretically explain these contradictory patterns. And this summer, I started testing my theory in the field. I took hundreds of soil samples along moose trampled areas in two ecosystems, low nitrogen heath and high nitrogen forests. By quantifying soil compaction and moisture, microbial community composition and abundance, and the quantity of inorganic nitrogen in my soil samples, my results will give a very detailed picture of the connection between moose, microbes, and the flow of nitrogen, and how these links can change in different ecosystems. Ultimately, my results will help determine whether our general principle simply needs to be tweaked or thrown away entirely. Ecosystems are complex, but in a changing world, the need for general understanding is pressing. Climate change and human activity are pushing the world's largest herbivores into ecosystems they haven't been for centuries, if ever. What will be the long-term impacts on ecosystem services like fertile soil, healthy forests, and natural carbon storage? My work will help discover guiding ecological principles that can solve these problems and others so we can live sustainably on this planet for a long time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. I'm going to let the judges have a
Okay, judges. Good. Okay, Julie, the next slide, please. Okay, I want to make sure Sylvana is here. Hello, can you hear me all right? I sure can, Sylvana. Welcome. So I want to welcome Savannah Rodriguez Piria. Savannah is a PhD student in chemistry with the Faculty of Science at Memorial University. Savannah's thesis is titled Fabrication and Characterization of Diphiophobines and Tetrafiophobines. I said that incorrectly, so I'm going to ask you to say it. Go ahead. The Tiophobines and Tetrafiophobines. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Don't feel bad because also, I practiced that many, many years <laughs> to get it right. <laughs> well, you're you're brilliant in your area, I'm sure. So thank you for for giving me on that. And uh, ultra thin films is the end of your thesis title. So I want to welcome you here today, Julie. Can you advance to the next slide for Savannah? Savannah, great. And we can see it. And we know your audio is good. So whenever you're ready, please begin. Good luck. Hello, everyone. We all agree that electronics devices are now an essential part of our lives, and we use them on a daily basis. Most of the commercial electronics incorporate mineral materials, such as silicon and gold. In fact, there are tiny gold switches in the computer or cell phone that you're using right now to, to watch this presentation. These mineral materials are good for most of our needs, but they limit the size and the speed of devices. It means that in order to build, smaller, more energy efficient, and faster devices, we need to use our kind of materials. And that's where the TFOVIN and tetratiofovalin molecules come in handy. They're not minerals, but organic compounds. Compounds made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. And they have been successfully used in previous studies to build solar cells, optical devices, and sensors. While these are great news, these organic materials are still used in bulk. And we want to push the limits and make it a two-dimensional film out of these molecules. So my PhD project involves a fabricate a film one million times thinner than a strand of hair. By turning these organic compounds into two-dimensional films, we risk losing the electronic properties that make them so useful. I say we risk losing them because the way the molecules are stacked on a bulk is different from the way they are arranged in a film. And when it comes to electronic properties, the way molecules are stacked against each other is just as important as the molecules themselves. However, it is worth the risk because if our experiments are successful, it would be possible to produce much thinner electronics or even novel electronics. So, making films that are 1 million times thinner than a strand of hair is not an easy task. There is almost no room for error during the fabrication process. Anything that you do is slightly different is enough to affect the molecules arrangement and compromise the quality of the film. I spent most time of my research time optimizing the fabrication method that would give me the exact same film with the exact same properties every time I made it. Thankfully, now I have a reproducible procedure to make these films, and those films are stable, durable, and elastic. They are, these are very exciting results, especially because elastic films, they're out there, they're mostly made of plastic. And as we know, plastic doesn't conduct electricity very well. Having a conductive film that is elastic, it means that it's durable, foldable electronics is also a real possibility now. I went as far as fabricating and analyzing their stability and elasticity. The next step in my project is to look into the electronic properties of these films and determine whether or not they are suitable for the purpose I envision it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so thank you so much for your presentation, Savannah. I'm going to let the judges just take a couple of notes. Thank. You. Just a question. Um, did we miss someone? Did we? We didn't have um, Sam, did we? Julie, can you check in my PowerPoints? I didn't notice it, so I don't know. I, if maybe last minute. Yeah, I sent a revised list, Stuart. Okay. Of, uh, okay. Sorry. Of That's okay. That's okay. Good. To, good to keep us on our toes. Yeah. So just have a look at that because there was there was a couple of changes.
judges, are we okay? Good, all right, next slide, please. Okay, is Irfan with us? Oh, you're on the yes. screen, excellent. I didn't see you at first and your sound is working. Okay, we have Irfan Mushtaq, welcome. Uh, Irfan is a Master of Science student, Bore Boreal Ecosystems and Agricultural Sciences with the Faculty of Science with our Granville campus uh, of Memorial University. So welcome. Your thesis is titled Nitrogen Fertilizer Stabilizers, an Effective Approach to Control Nitrogen Losses and to Fight Climate Change. So welcome. I'm going to ask Julie to advance to the next slide. Great, I can see it. So that means I think everyone else can. So I invite you to begin whenever you're ready. Good. Climate change is the biggest concern worldwide, including Canada. Canada's average temperature is increasing by 1.7 degrees Celsius annually from 1948. So what will happen if we say climate is changing? So it will in result in increase in earth temperature, ocean warming, snow melt, and sea, sea level rise, which may result in floods. So why are we focusing towards climate change? Because we want to know how climate is changing so that we can prepare ourselves for better future life. So if we talk about the major causes of climate change, so after electricity and heat production, agriculture is contributing approximately 24% towards global warming. So you will think how agriculture is contributing. So here is the concept of my research. As you know, farmers apply fertilizer to increase their crop growth. As nitrogen is an essential micronutrient for crop growth and production, so farmers are using more nitrogenous fertilizer to increase their crop yield. But more than 50% of their applied nitrogen is being lost, either ammonia volatilization, nitrate leaching, and nitrous oxide gas emission as a result of denitrification. And this nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas, and it has 300 times more global warming potential than carbon dioxide. So in this way, we, we are not only losing nitrogen in the soil, but also we are facing the climate change problem. So the, the solution for this problem is we are using nitrogen fertilizer stabilizers in the form of nitrification and urease inhibitor. So what they do, basically, these are the chemical compounds like fertilizer. So when we apply in the soil, they suppress the activity of microbe involved in these processes and process slow down and plant get more time to uptake nitrogen in, in being instead of being lost. So by using nitrogen fertilizer stabilizers, it not only reduces the nitrogen losses and uh, the cost of production, but also increases the farmer's profit and improve the climatic conditions by reducing the nitrous oxide emission gas. So at the end, I would say we won't have a society if we destroy the environment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irfan. I'll ask the judges to take a moment. Mandy, I see that you're ready. Stuart, are you okay? Great. The, the tiles bounce around. It's so funny. Andrea, are you good? Great. Okay, Julie, next slide, please. Okay. We right. have our next student. Great. I, I can hear you. So I'm going to introduce you now. Can Can Amalaje. Dilam Pereira, I want to welcome you. Now, do you prefer to go by Dilam? 
Yes, yes, I got one dilemma. I noticed on your screen you you have dilemma there, so I just wanted to make sure. Great, yes. I want to welcome you here today. You're a Master of Engineering, Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science student here at Memorial University. And your thesis title is Investigation of Reaction Kinetics Needed for CUC I2 Hydrolysis Using Fluidize Moving Bed Reactor. So I'm going to ask Julie to kindly go to your next slide. Excellent, we can see it. Dilong, whenever you're ready, please begin. Good luck. Hydrogen production. Water decomposition would be the cleanest method to produce hydrogen. But this reaction needs higher graded energy, such as electricity, and higher temperature requirements. To reduce these things, researchers are working on thermochemical cycles. There are a few promising thermochemical cycles. In this research, I'm going to work, to work with copper chloride thermochemical cycle, since it has the lowest temperature requirement. The concept behind this thermochemical cycle is very simple. We input water in the form of steam, and after a series of reactions with the copper chloride, we will get hydrogen as the main product, as well as oxygen as the uh, byproduct. Copper chloride will get involved with the reactions, but it will not be consumed uh, with, uh, within the uh, cycle. Therefore, uh, this thermochemical cycle becomes sustainable. Now, hydrolysis reaction is the most important reaction within these, with these uh, reactions within the thermochemical cycle. In this hydrolysis reaction, we will have solid copper chloride and gaseous steam uh, reacting. When this solid copper chloride uh, starts to react, it will go under the shrinking core model, which means the outer surface of these uh, particles first get to start to react. And then the reaction zone gradually goes inwards to the core. So after some time, there will be unreacted core and that will be covered by a product, product layer. Now, steam has to go through this product layer to meet the surface uh, reaction surface. So there will be two different kinds of resistance for the steam. One is uh, internal diffusion resistance within the uh, product layer and uh, surface reaction resistance. According to the initial particle size, uh, these uh, uh, reaction types will be controlling. So you can expect when you have a larger particle size, then uh, it's more likely to be the product layer resistance would be the uh, controlling step. So when you have a range of these uh, particle sizes, first you have uh, one kind of resistance, and then after an effective particle size, there will be another resistant type. So finding that uh, effective particle size under the given uh, uh, conditions, which are temperature and pressure, is my research. Thank you. Thank you, Dilam. I'm going to let the judges have a moment. Mandy, are you okay? Good, Stuart. Good, Andrea, good. Okay, Julie, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Great. All right, Dean, are you with us? I am, can you hear me? Yes, I can, that's great. Welcome, Dean McIsaac, with yep. uh, the Master of Technology Management program at the Marine Institute of Memorial University. Dean's thesis title is Corporate Entrepreneurship in Canadian Healthcare, a Model Framework. So I'm gonna kindly ask Julie to advance to the next slide, please. Great, and I can see it okay. Dean, you are not on my screen, so I just wanna make sure, yeah, okay, I can see you now. Uh, I wish you luck and begin whenever you're ready. 
This is my beautiful wife, Samantha. And despite her pleasant appearance in this photo, she copes with an undiagnosed condition that presents as unending pain and fatigue in her neck, shoulders, and upper back. Even lifting a cup of coffee, as in this photo, can cause her significant pain. Samantha first entered our healthcare system about five years ago when she was administered morphine just to take the edge off. But to date, no test or prescription drug has yielded any real relief. So over a million Canadians face similar circumstances. That's a million people who have been told by our healthcare system, sorry, we just don't know how to help you. Our healthcare system is flawed, but as a healthcare professional, I believe that the needed transformative change is achievable through innovation. Healthcare organizations across the country are engaged in all kinds of innovation activities, and the pandemic has only made the case for health innovation even more compelling. Nonetheless, health professionals are finding it difficult to create and sustain innovation programs in these large, complex, adaptive systems. In these healthcare organizations, when you change one part of the system, you actually end up creating unexpected and often unknown and undesirable changes in other parts of the system. Additionally, regional differences that shape the administration and healthcare in Canada have led to a very inconsistent innovation landscape. So regions and hospitals all embrace innovation with their own goals, with their own strategies, and although there are many pan-Canadian working groups, collectives, and associations about innovation in healthcare, there's no single innovation standard. So I'll say that again, I could find no innovation standard that's generally accepted as an approach to implementing innovation activities specific to the Canadian healthcare context, which is really important. So I shifted my gaze away from the healthcare and I looked to find how big innovative companies from other industries like Google or 3M or Xerox could be so successful in innovation. What really comes down to their employees, these companies benefit from strong entrepreneurial cultures that are managed through their corporations. This is called corporate entrepreneurship. Corporate entrepreneurship programs engage and support employee innovation efforts through specific and appropriate supports and resources. The, the concept of corporate entrepreneurship also really plays into the idiom that healthcare professionals have this unique and profound need to make a difference in their patients' lives. So when you think about it, in Canada, we have 1.6 million healthcare employees. I can only see that now as 1.6 million chances that someone can help my wife. My research has led to the creation of Canada's first model for corporate entrepreneurship by compiling antecedents and other success factors from within the healthcare and other industries. The model framework provides a standard from which any healthcare organization can implement corporate entrepreneurship programming while allowing for the variability of their unique regional, political, and cultural contexts. My hope is that the work will make a difference in the development of our health system so my wife can again enjoy a pain free cup of coffee. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean. Just give the judges a moment. Mandy, are you okay? Great. Andrea and Stuart, you can just let me know with a thumbs up when you're ready. All good? Great. All right, Julie, next slide, please. Okay, Marianne, you want to check your volume there to make sure I can hear you? Yes, can you hear me? Perfect. Yes, I can. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome, Miriam Forotan who is a Master of Arts student in Geography with the Faculty of Humanities and Social Science at Memorial University. Miriam's thesis title is Studying in a New Home, Geographies of International Student Housing at Memorial University of Newfoundland and the Impact of COVID-19. Julie, could you put up Miriam's first uh, herself? Yep, great. Miriam, um, I can see your slide. So that means whenever you're ready, please feel free to begin. Good luck. Thank you. They are a mobile part of society. They have come from, from diverse backgrounds. They have temporary migration status. They create diversity in university. Yes, I'm talking about international students like myself. International students are considered future as real immigrants in Canada. This is even more significant in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador without migration and being unsuccessful in attracting and retaining newcomers. Given that Memorial University has a promising role in supporting provincial immigration goals. But what makes international student a vulnerable population? 
According to Statistic Canada, international students pay on average four times more tuition fees than their domestic counterparts in Canadian universities. Uh, the growing number of international student enrollments have emphasized this economy, economic role, while this higher education expansion combined with, with rising tuitions, we are witnessing international student financial precarity. Although the decision to move is economically, socially, and politically embedded, cost factors and housing costs are key in enrollment because grants and financial supports may cover the tuition, but do not always cover living expenses and housing costs. The demand for student housing on and off campus are, is growing. International students are commonly concerned about finding suitable housing that offers more than a roof over a student's head. Two major factors are distance and cost. Living on or near campus is very important. Nevertheless, there are limited on-campus housing options, and most of the near-campus options are expensive. Instead, they may decide to search for low-cost share of campus housing in the private market, which is not even affordable. The tendency to reduce the cost can, can be seen subletting spaces to others or signing a lease without indicating the correct number of people, bedroom sharing, living far from the university in response to this housing offer uh, on affordability. And some landlords uh, take advantage of housing crisis that make a student even more vulnerable to scams and substandard conditions. But it is very important to consider that not all international students have the same issues. Indeed, they have varied levels of vulnerability. Um, but this is very important to consider that a student may perceive their home in a supportive and welcoming atmosphere, but they also may refer to themselves as outsiders and not accepted by the locals. And I'm looking for the connection between housing experiences and interaction with the community and their perceptions of the city uh, as welcoming. Uh, but the downsides of the COVID-19 on international students have highlighted their experiences of vulnerability and they face more challenges than usual. Imagine a students with precarious financial situation that are confined in a signal, single bedroom or in an overcrowded home. Or, or, I argue international students' housing experiences in COVID-19 also reflect the inequality of confinement and inequality of um, educational opportunities. Uh, lastly, the long-term of implication of um, COVID on international students is still unknown. If Canada and this province wish to return international students as future citizens, it needs to continue and expand their efforts to support them in post-pandemic era. Thank you, Miriam. Give the judges a moment. Hey, judges. Andy's good. Andrea's good. All good, Stuart? Okay, great. Thank you. Hey, Julie, next slide, please. Okay, I want to welcome Kamisika. Can you do a sound check for us? Can you hear me, Will? Kamsika? Yes, I can, Kamsika. Thank you. So I, I want to welcome Kamsika Jiraza, Master of Science student in Boreal Ecosystems and Agricultural Sciences with the Faculty of Science, Grantville Campus, with Memorial. Um, the title of your thesis is Design, 
fabrication and evaluation of a simple, low cost, vertical hydroponics garden for household. So welcome, and I'm gonna ask Julie to kindly put up your slide. Excellent, I can see it. And whenever you are ready, Tamasika, please begin. We are living in a beautiful country where there is a significant seasonal changes in terms of temperature, precipitation, and et cetera. And also we have intermittent weather changes like snowstorm and frost. Due to this, we have only three to four months of growing period. During this period, farmers struggle a lot to produce handful of vegetables. However, three to four months of production is not enough to feed all of us for 12 months. How many of you know that 90% of the vegetables that we eat today are from imported from other countries and other provinces of Canada? Fairy curries of our vegetables and when there is an adverse condition, fairy stop operations. So we end up empty shelves in the groceries like in the pictures. So this picture is taken by my friend uh, one day after the snowstorm in 2019, uh, December. This will cause high demand for vegetables and high prices of vegetables. This will lead to empty plate on our dining table. On the other hand, just imagine you have a home garden at your home with your favorite vegetables throughout the year. Is it possible? Yes, it is. Hydroponics is the solution. Hydroponics is growing plants without soil. So it is growing plant with a nutrient solution. But people get panic with the terms of hydroponic system because uh, most of the hydroponic garden available in the market are too expensive, too technical, too messy, too energy consuming and too time consuming. So I wanted to design and develop a hydroponic system for household, which is affordable in price, simple in technology and has some aesthetic value and also less time and less energy consuming. I did some uh, surveys and uh, interviews to find the need about the hydroponic system for household and I got some positive response. So I successfully fabricated my first prototype and the evaluation part is ongoing. It is looks like a upscaled DNA with two spirals. This system is uh, developed with a uh, nutrient circulation mechanism, which can be even done by us kids at your home. So it utilizes the light and heat energy of the household and uh, to grow the plants and it is totally weather independent. At the end of the day, we all will be self-sufficient in, in terms of vegetables and also it will give some self-satisfaction. My goal is to attract everyone and encourage them to grow in this uh, uh, hydroponic system pro to produce their own vegetables. So let's grow together. Thank you. Thank you, Kim Sika. I'll give the judges a moment. Stuart, I see that you're done your notes. Mandy, you're good to go. Andrea, thank you. Okay, Julie, next slide, please. Okay, is Stephanie with us? I'm not seeing Stephanie on my screen. So just I, I am stuff. here. Okay, here. great. Okay. I can hear you wonderfully, Stephanie. That's great. We have Stephanie Glant, who is a PhD student in chemistry with the Faculty of Science at Memorial University. Uh, Stephanie's thesis title is the use of nanoscale magnetic ferrites as components of plasmonic sensors for, I think you probably say SERS detection, or do you say SERS? SERS, yeah. SERS detection of persistent organic pollutants. Okay, Stephanie, I'm going to ask Julie to please put up your slide. Great, we can see it. Um, Stephanie, your volume is good, so I invite you to begin when you are ready and good luck. What if a beam of light could tell us if water was safe to drink? 
My research involves developing sensors to do this very thing, looking at harmful organic pollutants in water. Pollutants like polyaromatic hydrocarbons are major byproducts of the oil and gas industry, causing cancers, neurological problems, uh, birth defects, where even small amounts are a big concern because these molecules are fat soluble and they build up over time. We develop sensors to study materials using light, which is known as spectroscopy, where measuring light from a sample will tell us about the stuff present. We can use the light to identify unknowns and also develop special surfaces to help boost the amount of light that we can collect. We can think of bonds between atoms like, like two balls attached by a spring, where any energy added makes the spring move, and this is a bond vibration. Light is a form of energy, and so when we study materials using light, we're adding energy to the sample and we're exciting these bonds. Bonds can do several different types of movements, and different movements require different amounts of energy. The same way that standing up and doing a jumping jack will take much more energy than just raising your arm above your head. Um, and these different energies of vibrations are measured, and we can use this information to figure out which kinds of atoms or elements are in a sample, and also how these are arranged together. For the type of spectroscopy that I work with, the new light that we want to measure has less energy than the input light, and this only makes up about 1% of all of the light we collect. So we're playing a very tough statistical game. Therefore, we use electromagnetic fields to our advantage in order to increase the chances of success. So we make sensors out of metals like silver or gold, and these are known as plasmonic metals. And what this means is they have lots of free moving electrons on their surface, and these big clouds of electrons will also get hit with the light when we're doing our measurements. So these electrons on the surface help boost the signal across the entire surface itself. So my research goes a step further, which introduces magnetic materials into the mix, where magnetic fields interact with light and vice versa. So we've developed the first working sensor, with which takes advantage of this using very tiny magnets on the surface. We pattern these nanomagnets onto a layer of gold using a strong magnetic field, and using this field creates a complex surface with a radial wheel and spoke type patterning, where there's areas of high and low density of these nanomagnets. And this creates lots of places for our samples to adhere, and this helps us to detect the dilute amounts of hydrocarbon in any water sample. So our sensor is not only novel in its design, but it's also cost effective to make, it's quick to use, and it's reusable. So we're pushing our field ahead with the use of magnetic materials in vibrational spectroscopy, and we hope this technique can become the go-to method for fast and accurate detections. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just give the, uh, the judges a moment. Mandy, you look like you're okay. Stuart, are you good to go? And Andrea's good to go. And just for the interest of our audience members and the final participants, uh, there's four presentations remaining, I believe. Is that correct, Julie? Yes, that's correct. I wanted to do a little check because I know we're going to be slightly over time, not too bad, but um, I know sometimes people have to go, so I just want to let you know that. So if we can get our next presenter introduction slide up, please. Okay, and Matthew Drew, you're with us. I can see you on screen. And do you want to do a sound check? You're on mute. Uh, can you hear me okay? Sure can. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, so welcome to Matthew Drew, uh, PhD students in physics and physical oceanography, the Faculty of Science at Memorial University. And Matthew's thesis is titled Testing the Regolith Hypothesis. I'm going to ask Julie to please put up your slide. Great, I can see it. Um, Matthew, whenever you're ready, please begin and good luck. Mitigating and adapting to climate change will require an understanding of how the Earth system works. The Earth system is a complex of components like ice sheets, oceans, and the atmosphere. We have a broad picture of how these Earth system puzzle pieces fit together, in part pieced together through direct observation. 
However, these observations extend back only 150 years, a period during which we haven't seen any major climate transitions. To understand major transitions in the Earth system, we need to look further back at events in our geologic past. Perhaps the most significant event of the last 2 million years was the mid-Pleistocene transition. This transition marked a shift in the behavior of cl Earth's climate cycles we call glacial cycles. These glacial cycles are so big that they heaped enough ice on land to drop the global oceans by 120 meters. Have a look at the chart in the center. Early on in this last 2 million year period, shown in blue on the right, the ice sheets of the world grew and melted with the pacing of the sun at a cycle of about 40,000 years from melting to growing and back to melting. Then a million years ago, shown in red, thousands, uh, thousands, sorry, shown in red, without any change in pacing from the sun, the ice sheet began skipping warm periods growing much larger than the earlier ice sheets before melting away. These larger ice sheets now followed a pacing of 100,000 years versus the 40,000 years of the earlier smaller sheets. What caused such a large change? To understand this, I'm using numerical ice sheet models. I am simulating the most variable of all the ice sheets, the North American ice sheet. This ice sheet covered all of Canada and grew thick enough to bury Ontario in over three kilometers of ice. Before the big transition, Canada was covered in loose sediment called regolith. This soft regolith provided a slippery bed for the North American ice sheet. But today we know the Canadian shield is bare hard rock, much like Newfoundland. Hard bedrock is much higher friction and slows the response of ice to a changing climate. My simulations are showing that the North American ice sheet could have pushed all the soft regolith off the Canadian shield around the time of the mid Pleistocene transition, laying bare the sticky bedrock. Before the sediment removal, the soft bedded ice sheet responds more quickly to a changing climate, while the hard bedded ice sheet is more stable and survives warm periods. My work shows how the change in Canadian landscape from slippery sediment to bare sticky rock may have revolutionized global climate cycles. This work gives us one more piece of the earth system puzzle. We need to understand complex interactions and emergent shifts in the earth system. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Just give the judges a moment. Andy, you seem to be ready. Stuart, you're good. And Andrea's good. Okay, Julie, the next student's introduction slide, please. Okay, we have Prasenjit. Are you with us? I see you on screen. Can you just do a, a sound check, please? Yeah, I think it's good. I, yeah, it is great. Thank you. Prasenjit Devnath is with us, who is a Master of Arts in Religious Studies with the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences with Memorial University. And the title of Prasenjit's uh, thesis is Islamist Cyber Radicalization, a Threat to the Existence of Hindu Religious Minority in Bangladesh. So I would like Julie, please, to advance to the slide. Perfect. Okay, Prasenjit, when you're ready, good luck and please be. Okay. Well, Islamist cyber radicalization in Bangladesh is a very common uh, phenomenon nowadays. Basically, Islamist cyber radicalization is a process through which uh, Islamist extremists or cyber radicalists uh, post different propaganda or uh, spread uh, religious uh, extremist news over the social media to incite or motivate the youth people, basically the like-minded Islamic youth people to attack the Hindu religious minority or other minorities or the secular government of our country. So I'm giving you an example, which is a very practical situation regarding this uh, cyber radicalization in Bangladesh. Few days ago, during the Durga Puja, which is the biggest festival for Bengali Hindu people in Bangladesh and cyber uh, Islamist, 
just posted a video on his Facebook portal saying that the Hindu community dishonored the Holy Quran during the Puja. And the post went on viral and many like-minded extremists gathered around and started attacking to the Hindu religious minorities, houses and temples and vandalized so many idols. So when the situation was investigated by the police officer or the legal authority, it was revealed that there was nothing happened or any conduction by any Hindu people. It was just a propaganda which was just done by any a Islamist cyber radicalist. So basically, what is the motive behind such kind of activities or behind such kind of heinous activities? So there are two possibilities I have found in my research. That is, uh, they they want to demolish the Hindu existence in Bangladesh along with other religious minorities like Christianity or Buddhism and they want to establish a Islamic uh, Sharia law based uh, instead of any democratic constituency as long as our government like Bangladesh government is a democratic country and democratic uh, holding democratic uh, constituency which also uh, demonstrate the equality of all religions. Apart from that, my research is also uh, to let people or uh, to let the government know about the current scenario of the cyber radicalization in Bangladesh and also to raise awareness in our people of our country along with our world and to give some trajectories recommendation to tackle the Islamic cyber radicalization through the uh, counter cyber radicalization. Uh, functions or measures. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll give the judges a moment. Andy, you look ready. Stuart, ready. Andrea, you're good. Okay, Julie, if we could have our next slide, please. Okay, is Tebe here? Uh, yes, I'm here. Hi. Great. Hi, we can hear you. So I want to welcome Tebe Saravi, who is a PhD student in our Faculty of Education here at Memorial. Your thesis title is Social Skills Development in Newcomer Bilingual Children. So I'm going to ask Julie to please put your slide that you prepared up. And I invite you to present when you're ready. Good luck. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, children from immigrant families are the fastest growing segment of Canadian population. In 2019, the immigrant population consists almost 21% of Canadian population. Why the most, uh, most recent data show Canada welcomed uh, 70,500 newcomers in the first three months of the year, compared to just over 69,000 in 2020. Such, find, such figures have profound policy implications for meeting our nation's child's uh, need uh, and demand attention. One area that needs more attention is the social skills development of immigrant children, as they are uh, more, uh, more likely to experience challenges in building relationships with others because of their language limitation. Social skills development is essential in uh, generating positive outcomes for mental health and well-being throughout the childhood and later life. My research intended to study social skill development among newcomer bilingual kindergartners. Benefiting from a mixed message research approach, I will explore the barriers and difficulties that newcomer bilingual children face in, so in social skills development. The first step will consist of evaluating the children's um, current level of social skills. Based on this evaluation, the second step will involve designing an intervention. Then a post-intervention assessment will be administrated to determine the effect of 
uh, of the intervention on so on social on students' social skills. I will also conduct the interview with the uh, teachers and parents to better understand their concern and points of view regarding barrier and difficulties that newcomer children face in their social skill development. Another source of data is a uh, curricular content relevant to social skill development and uh, taught by a uh, kindergarten teacher. I will, class, I will cross check uh, this uh, data to shape light on the target population social skills development and um, provide the decision makers with evidence based funding so they can plan uh, more effectively, effectively for this population. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tadja. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to give the judges a moment. Okay, Stuart, you look ready. Mandy, you're okay. Andrew is okay. And Julie, I believe this is our final presentation. Is that correct? Yes, this is the last one. Okay, if we could put the introductory slide up. Great. Karan Deep, do you prefer to be called Karan? I know on your screen it says, uh, but your full name is Karan Deep Dillon. Yeah. Uh, so I want to welcome you here, Karan. Uh, you're a Master of Science student with the Computer Science uh, faculty with Memorial University. Your thesis title is Lung Cancer Screening on computed tomography using a biologically inspired AI trained on human eye movements. So Julie, okay. if you could put up Randeep's uh, slide, great. So I wish you all the luck and begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to present my research on lung cancer screening. I've divided this talk in three parts. First, I'm gonna tell you why we're doing this research. Then we are, I'm, I'm going to tell you where we are, and then I'll, I'll take you forward, like what's the future of our research. First, starting with why we're doing this research. So lung cancer is the most dangerous cancer of all the other type, and last year itself, it caused around 1.61 million deaths. And most of these deaths are caused because lung cancer got diagnosed in stage 4 and stage 5. And if unluckily any one of us get diagnosed in stage 4 and 5, it's very difficult to recover because the lung cancer has grown up to a stage when uh, it is not able to cure just using the medicines. And uh, the reason we are not able to detect the lung cancer in earlier for one, two, three stages is the lung cancer nodules. So nodules are the small patches of the lung cancer. So they are so small, like sometimes radiologists also miss out the information. So he's not able to uh, diagnose if there is a lung cancer pre present in the earlier stage. So this is the reason we have uh, we have made a machine learning based model. So our what we have done is we have gathered the data set from radiologists from all, all over the world. They have labeled the uh, CT scans and medical images, and they have told us where is the lung nodule. And we have fed all this information to our machine learning based model. And if you see on the top right, that's an output from our machine learning based model under strategy one. So that's the uh, CT scan of a person who was diagnosed with uh, lung cancer. And if you see the arrow, that's a small 3 mm nodule. It's a cancerous patch. And this is stage two cancer. It, it, it's getting detected by our AI, but radiologist misses out this information. So our machine learning based model is actually uh, more accurate than a, than a single radiologist because we are feeding the uh, knowledge of uh, more than uh, 100 radiologists to our machine learning based model. And the average time our radiologists take to diagnose one CT scan is 15 minutes. So in a day, he just scans around 20 to 30 uh, medical images. But now with our AI, this uh, time has reduced to five minutes because our AI is telling the radiologist where to look at. So it's actually aiding up the radiologist. So the, our strategy too, which we are now building right now is we are capturing the gaze of the radiologist and we are trying to train the model or how, how the radiologist look. So this will be more accurate than straight strategy one. And the future is not to remove the radiologist or doctor from the loop, but to add the AI tools and machine learning based tool uh, in, in the 
in the loop and the doctors will be able to leverage them to give the more accurate result and, uh, and a faster result. So it will aid them to look uh, at the specific spot. Thank you. Thank you, Karan. I'll let the judges have a moment. I think Stuart is ready. Andrea, you're ready? And Mandy, you can just let me know when you're ready. Okay, great. So at this time, this is the end of the presentation. I wanna thank uh, all the students for a marvelous job. It is not an easy task to talk about your thesis period, let alone under the rigid rules, I guess, of 3MT. Um, uh, so I want to really thank you for putting yourself out there because it can't be easy. So we're going to take the judges deliberation break, which means we go to a breakout room. So for any audience members who want to stay, please feel free to stay in the main room. And of course, participants, I ask you to stay in the meeting room as well. Julie, does it normally take 10 to 15 minutes? Is that a good range? About that, yeah. And, but it's only the three judges that are in the breakout right. room. Right, yeah. Yeah, and, and do what do I go into the breakout room with the judges? Uh, no, it's fine. No, they can, okay. and actually, um, normally I would go in and out, but I think Andrea, if you'd like, just um, for to facilitate it, you can just let me know as a representative of the uh, through text what you decide. If you have any questions, just let me know, and I'll come in. And in the meantime, we do have a guest speaker during that time, so you can okay, just let me know when you're whenever you're ready. Um, Judges, Andrew, you can let me know. And Darcy's going to put three of you in a breakout room now. Okay, I think the judges are now gone to their breakout room. And Julie, our guest speaker, was able to attend today. I wanted to confirm that. Yes, yes. Okay, Indeed. and do we have, do I, we have a separate slide for that? No, we don't. It's just, uh, it's just going to say a few words about his experience with 3MT. Um, okay. And Darcy's going to um, make sure that he's on screen here. I think you should okay, be there. Perfect. Be there, Anthony, are you? Anthony, I was going to say, Anthony, if you would introduce yourself, I think that would be very fitting. Um, so uh, I'll mute myself, Anthony, and... Uh, Please take it away with your experience with the 3MT. Uh, your story is really, really wonderful. So uh, I can't wait to hear from your perspective. Oh. Before you, before you start, Anthony, I'm going to just let the folks know that I'm going to post a link in the chat of a Gazette story just to give them some okay. background. So when you speak, yeah. All right. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Amy and uh, Julie. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today just to. Uh, talk about my experience uh, with respect to 3MT. <laughs> and I would like to start by congratulating all the presenters today, wonderful presentations. Uh, just bring back uh, a lot of memories. <laughs> yeah, uh, an average thesis would take about, uh, let's say between seven to eight hours to present if you're going to go through everything word for word. You know, it's a difficult job to summarize everything in three minutes. It's very, very challenging. So uh, uh, my story, uh, I started my experience with respect to 3MT started in 20, 2018, uh, that's around um, November, around this time, 2018. And that's the first time ever that I will be, you know, presenting my thesis to a lay audience. And um, prior to that time, I was having a chat with uh, one of the professor emeritus in my department, Department of Biochemistry. I did uh, nutritional biochemistry in um, biochemistry department. So I'm talking about the person of Professor Sean Brosnan. So we're having a chat in the lunch room, and, and he, he made mention of something that really changed my, you know, my my perspective about life. So he said, if there's any graduate student that is doing any research and cannot explain that research to a grade six student, and the student will understand what he's saying, that means the student does not understand the research himself or herself. 
and that really you know struck a chord with me and he went ahead and said okay what's the benefit of research is to is to is to benefit mankind and if the people you are doing the research for cannot understand what you are doing for them then it's more or less like a wasted effort so when that conversation ended i, I was just i was just all by myself and i was thinking can i even explain my research to myself <laughs> and i would understand what i am doing so that was it you know, turning point, and that actually changed my worldview about what research should be. So I went home and, you know, uh, and I started simplifying my research. And at some point, I, I got to a spot that I thought, okay, this is simple enough for anybody to understand. So I applied to the Faculty of Science uh, competition. And fortunately for me, I, I won uh, first place in that competition. Then I thought I have it all. <laughs> Then uh, I applied for the university wide, just like uh, you're having today. I'm sure uh, Julie will be smiling by now. <laughs> I went there to present and I saw better presenters and uh, they just pushed me aside. <laughs> and that was in 2018. So then I learned that uh, to remain successful, there's need for continuous improvement. Uh, if you've done it once and you've done it well, then you need to start building on it to to remain on top and the question is if what you have presented is going to be the best today will it be the best tomorrow and that's an important question for anybody to you know to ask himself or, or herself so i came back in 2019 and, and the story was different and, and of course i i tried to uh, uh, prepare myself better and um you know and from there you know a lot of other competitions now and then and finally, the, the national one, which was uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, that was decided by um, people's choice. And uh, memory happens to be the, the first place in that competition, uh, if I'm not mistaken, for the first time. So what have I learned so far with respect to 3MT and uh, presentation in three minutes? Um, and this would be to, you know, to the presenters, to the have a hook what do i mean you know bring people into your research space you know make them comfortable enough to want to learn what you are trying to you know what you are trying to sell to them and um, from that that moment on you can go into the specifics but before you go into the specifics start with something generic that everybody can relate with you know and um, don't don't forget to start with what you want to say and end with what you have said because uh, a lot of people learn in circles. You know, you start with what you want to say and you end with what you have said. And um, one key thing I've learned also is uh, simplify your language. You know, I cannot uh, overemphasize that because um, most of the presenters here will agree with me that in research, we, we talk in technical terms. And, uh, you know, a lay population may not really understand some of the jargons that we use, <laughs> you know, so it's good to simplify those and uh, bring it as such as you are explaining it to your grandmother, you know. <laughs> and um, the third, which is the most important, is practice, you know, practice, practice, practice. I practice so much that my wife can literally recite my lines <laughs> at home, you know. Uh, you practice to an extent that even if you shut down your brain, you will still, you know, go go ahead and, and be coherent with what you are trying to present. Uh, it's more or less like a muscle reflex, you know, and that's the power of practice, you know. So that's practically the long and short of my uh, three minute thesis journey. Uh, I'm not sure. If really great. I think he might have done it in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you, Anthony, I mean, your your story is just so great because it's it shows that the path isn't perfect. And I think that one of the biggest pressures we see students put on themselves is the idea of perfection or not being able to be perfect and that really keeping them down. But I was curious now that you're able to reflect on your experience. Is there anything you would like to see changed in the competition? It's, I know you weren't prepared for this, but I have some ideas and, you know, we, we have different ways of knowing now. And I think we're all escalating to um, more uh, accessibility and things like that. So I was just wondering, was there anything you as a presenter, as a student could see this uh, with changing in 3MT? Any thoughts on that? 
Uh, with respect to 3MT, you know, uh, when I, anytime I look at the rules of the game, uh, I, I, I see it becoming difficult. <laughs> anytime I look at it, you know, it's not something you can, you know, it, it has to be a static slide. You can't bring anything into it. And um, I'm not sure if I have anything that can be changed. The only thing that I think can be changed is how to ease out, you know, the pressure. If yeah. if there's you know maybe soft music between two presenters or you know just to ease Try out to the pressure, the pressure. You yeah. know because a lot of pressure get built up uh, before you yeah. get on, and if you have not really practiced very well, uh, just uh, missing out a word can mess up the whole presentation. You know and. Uh, you know, if something can be done, uh, we can talk to psychologists. I we can <laughs> ease out the pressure from people, yeah. and let them become more comfortable. You know, that would go a long way to help. But um, when you face the challenge, we'll call it the challenge of the the middle part of your experience. Yeah. When you reflect it back on it, was there anything that you really you you said you know you always can do better, and there's always people who might be ahead of you, so you constantly have to kind of evolve and you know, I think you said stack on, or you had an expression like that. But was there anything you learned about yourself during the yes, uh, that you could share? One big lesson that I actually uh, took out of that experience uh, was that um, I can always do better, number one. Then number two, I don't see not winning as a defeat. I see mm -hmm. it as an opportunity to um, improve on myself. And I see it as an opportunity to learn from someone else. For example, when I when I did NAX, uh, I think 2020, I, I did NAX and um, I, I didn't win uh, NAX and, uh, but I learned a lot of lessons from those who presented. And one thing I saw is that uh, you have to really believe what you are presenting enough and show the passion with which you presented for anybody to key into your story. And I got to know that if, if you don't sound convincing to yourself, you are likely not going to convince anybody else, you know, and uh, right. just an experience. I went to a conference not too long ago and uh, after the presentation, I did a study on pregnancy and um, omega-3 consumption uh, for those who don't know. Then after the uh, presentation, a lady walked up to me and said, I have never met a guy talked about pregnancy so passionately like you. <laughs> I didn't know what to say, if it's going to be a compliment or not. I said, thank you. So what am I trying to bring out? Uh, you have to really show that you believe the story that you are presenting for anybody else to present that. And like I said, uh, I don't see not winning as a defeat. I see it as an opportunity to come out, come out better. In 2018, I did the university wide. Uh, I did not win, but I came back 2019 and I won first place. So. Uh, you can always do better and you can always come mm -hmm. back hotter and better, you know, and more prepared. Yeah. And since we have a lot of researchers in the room, <laughs> can you tell us where all that three minute presentation that you did many times, I'm sure it was varied during the, th the different times you did it. Where is your research now or where did it take you? Maybe to give us a little forward look for students who are in the room today. I think it's it, that's a valid question because uh, uh, a lot of people want to know. Okay, after all said and no, what next? What now? <laughs> uh, and it's a question that almost every graduate student don't want anybody to ask. <laughs> you know, because we don't know most of the time. Uh, currently, I'm a scientific specialist with Eastern Health. I am uh, working at the lab medicine division, and. Um, uh, let me start from what my research has done for me. So I did, uh, I, I studied effect of omega-3 metabolism on pregnancy outcomes. I was looking at brain development. I was looking at uh, maternal uh, regulation and lipid regulation and, and a lot of things. It's something I really enjoyed. And in fact, I proposed my research uh, topic uh, to my supervisor. So it's something I was passionate about to do. And in the course of my uh, PhD, I was able to, to write six publications in top journals. And I was able to write a book chapter about my research. So that 
placed me on a pedestal that uh, you know really worked out for me when I was looking for what to do after graduate uh, study. I completed my PhD December uh, 2020, and I started uh, working with Eastern Health January 12, 2021. In fact, I I got a job before I finished my PhD. So um, what am I trying to say? Um, hard work pays and, um, you know, favor, a lot of favor here and there as well. You know, but um, if there's any research you are doing to those who are doing it, uh, make sure you put your face out there, uh, you know, hard, hard uh, you know, face to your names, you know, and let, uh, let people see how relevant you are. And sometimes you may not work exactly uh, on that research, but you do something that you can use all the, all the skills that you have acquired in the course of your research. You do something that will make all those skills to be relevant uh, for your uh, future career and progression. Yeah, that's really great. And I'll I'll ask one question, and then we'll just have a breakout. I won't keep grilling you, but it's, it's always <laughs> great. To, students sure students want to me. want to see people who have recently left. Like, where do you go? Yeah. Are you where you thought you would be? Uh, you're about a year since your defense. I think that's fair to say. Yeah, so give or are take, you where yeah. you thought are you where you thought you would be when you first started graduate school? Um, uh, no, <laughs> no, I, I have a big vision for myself, um, and I see myself as a work in progress. And um, the day I just believe that the day you you see yourself that you have arrived, that's most likely the day you stop progressing, you know. So I I see myself being a, a big player with respect to research and development. And the interesting part of it now is that I work with animals, but now I'm into clinical studies, which is which is more relevant to human, you know. So I, I see myself, you know, uh, climbing the ladder one step at a time, you know, with respect to that and generating uh, methodologies with respect to clinical uh, assays um, that will be relevant even years after years to come, so to say, because mm -hmm. what I do currently now is to uh, develop and manage uh, clinical uh, methodologies, you know, how to, you know, manage people's condition, head conditions, so to say. So to answer your question, no, I'm still a work in progress. Uh, one day I would uh, look back and see how far I've gone and uh, give praise to God. <laughs> that's really great. I think you you have a really great ability to uh, self-reflect and that's a skill um, for sure. And the reason I asked that question was a lot of times we only talk about the professor pathway and a lot of students put pressure on themselves to find the professor job right out of um, university. And there are other pathways that keep your research, um, you know, moving and yeah. you keep learning. Yeah. So I think it's really helpful to talk about those career paths. And since Julie is all about career development, that's why I wanted to sort of circle back to that because getting a master's or a PhD opens up a world of possibilities, no matter what I think. And no matter what anyone says or does, no one can take away that education on you. So that's very important because I actually started as a food scientist. Uh, my, my first degree was in food science and technology. And um, when I uh, moved to the UK with uh, developing solution scholars, I, uh, uh, as a developing solution scholar, uh, I started nutritional studies uh, for my MSc. But to see how the you know, career path has you know, moved from food science and technology to the, my current state as a uh, clinical person, you know, there's, there's, there's no hand to development, so to say, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really great. Okay, well, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming here. Thank um, you so I much. hope it, it, it was fun for you rather than too much pressure, but I know um, I learned a lot from you, so thank you so it much. It was pressure then, but now it's fun. <laughs> and thank you for the work you're doing with Eastern Health. Uh, I think that's important to the community as well. And uh, so congratulations on that and thank you. Thank you so much and congratulations to all the presenters. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you so much. All right, my pleasure. Okay. Bye. Bye. What I'll invite people to do, Julie, while we're waiting is 
to take a break if they need to get a glass of water or something and i'll just mute myself sure. I, I anticipate the judges will be back just in a couple of minutes so sure. let's all just take a break but stay online is probably the best thing to do um yes. and uh, i'll i'll uh they should be back in a couple of minutes i'm sure anyway you just let me know when you hear i will do that okay thanks Darcy, the judges are ready now, so you can uh, take them out of the breakout room. Okay, uh, our judges should be back shortly. Yep, Dave, I don't know if you heard that, Amy, that they've made their decision and I... Yes. Okay. So, Julie, um, who do we normally get to announce the decision? Do you want me to do that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, I'll just make sure they're back. It usually takes 30 seconds for them to enter the room, so. Yeah, it's closing there now.
I should say too, um, before Amy, before you um, do announce the winners, that we we would like to get a screenshot of the three winners. Um, so when they are announced, uh, I will take down the slideshow, and uh, we could put your camera on, and we'll get a screenshot. Okay, judges, are we back? I see Mandy, I see Andrea, and I see Stuart. Okay, I want to welcome everyone back for the announcement of the winners. Uh, I'm a bit, I, I have the first names here, so I just want to make sure we don't have um, any, I don't have any mistakes made, so just give me one second there now. Not trying to draw this out anymore, I promise. So our first place winner is our, I'm going to make sure I have the last name here because I just want to make sure it's right. I'm really making the build up really intense, aren't I? Okay, we have Dean McIsaac is our first place winner, who is a master of technology management at the Marine Institute. And Dean's thesis was corporate entrepreneurship and Canadian healthcare. So congratulations, Dean. Do you wanna show yourself on video? Congratulations. Honestly, okay. flabbergasted. And Honestly, so many amazing people here today. Yes, congratulations. That's really, really great. Thank you. Well deserved. Well deserved. Okay. And our second place winner is our first presenter today, who is Heather Dix. Heather's a PhD in sociology with the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. Heather's thesis is How Have Remittances Associated with Migrants from the Global South? living in St. John's, Newfoundland, been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Heather, if you'd like to go on screen, congratulations. Thank you so much. So exciting. <laughs> congratulations. And our third place winner, this is gonna take me a second to get to this slide, to make sure I have the full name. Should have memorized the names, but I didn't. Was our... I believe our final presenter is our third place winner, Karandeep Dillon, who is a Master of Science student in Computer Science, Faculty of Science. Karandeep's thesis is lung cancer screening on computed tomography using biologically inspired AI trained on human eye movements. Karan, are you there? We can see you on screen. Oh, there we go. Congratulations, Karan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if our three winners um, can stay back, we would love to get a screenshot of you and maybe with the judges, if that's if that's okay. Um, and I want to thank the audience members, but I also want to thank all of the other presenters today. You were truly all marvelous. I think you're doing important work. There wasn't one thesis that I thought you know, why are they doing that? Every thesis made me wonder what what uh, what else I wanted to know more. So I think it's really exciting that your thesis are that impactful. So keep doing your great work, keep trying. And I hope Anthony's talk inspires you to keep entering things like this because it allows you to learn more about how you communicate your thesis. So congratulations to you all and have a wonderful evening. So if the winners could stay back, please do so.